May the Lord rejoice in his works. He looks at the earth and it trembles. He touches the mountains and they pour out smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God while I live. May my meditation be pleasing to him. I will rejoice in the Lord. May sinners vanish from the earth and wicked people be no more. My soul, bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time to gather this morning, to worship, to hear your word, to encourage one another. We pray your blessings upon our time together. Speak to our hearts and to our minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand and worship. Lift our voices in praise, or for a thousand tongues to sing.
Father, we thank you for this time to worship and to gather in your word and, and fellowship with one another. Lord, we pray your blessings upon our time together. We pray acknowledging that you are God and we're not. You are the sovereign creator of the universe. Yet you love us. You love us in spite of us. You are faithful to us when we are faithless. You show us grace. You show us mercy. You empower us with your Holy Spirit so that we could live a life that glorifies you and live for your purposes. And you allow us the privilege to come in the intimacy of the moment, not only as a congregation, as a community of faith, but in our own closets, and talk to you, and pray to you. You desire it, you command it. And God, we lift up those that are hurting and struggling this morning. We intercede for them. There's so many hurts in our world today. There's always been hurts in this fallen world. We pray for your comfort, for your strength, for your power, your provision in the lives of those people, and us for that matter. We lift up the leaders of our nation, from the president all the way down to the local councils and school boards of which we are a part. And we pray that somehow, some way, Christian wisdom is used to determine the decisions that are made that govern us. And Father, we pray that you would speak to us as we minister to one another. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here are the three giving options for the First Baptist Church of Hesperia. You can go to our website at fbch.org and choose Give at the right side of the menu. On the Give page, enter the amount you wish to give and choose if it is a one-time or a recurring give and press Next. You will then be asked to enter and confirm a phone number to continue to the payment page. You can also text FPC Hesperia to 77977 to receive a link to the same payment page. Another option is by cash or check. Please mail checks to 9280 Maple Avenue, Hesperia, California 92345. Thank you for your giving faithfulness. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to call the church. Well, good morning, everybody. Because of health stuff, I am announcements today. I'm Richard Spring. I attend the 8, 10, 15, and occasionally the 12, 30 service. No, I'm just kidding. 
So if you will just pay attention to the bulletin and to the website and other things that are going on, uh, just remind you that next Sunday night is our next Koinonia night. It'll be at 5 o'clock. We're going to have, uh, we're doing something a little different. Uh, I've asked Keith and we're going to kind of work together, put kind of a little Cajun boil together for you guys. And so, uh, what we, and then we'll have, for all of you who don't have the stomach for such things, uh, um, we will have hamburgers and hot dogs as well, okay? So we need you guys to bring um, uh, sides and, and desserts like we've been doing for our Koinonia nights. I want to encourage all of you to make your way back here. We'll probably do it outside on the front side of the building for that time of day and uh, just have a time together as a church family. We'll come back in here around 6.30. And we'll have our Koinonia service that we do. It's, we're, just, we're calling it Celebrating Hope. Uh, you're going to get a report from youth camp. Uh, we had six kids go off to children's camp this week. Uh, you'll also get a report from us who went to Peru next Sunday night uh, as well. And so we just want to talk about what God has done over the summer. And so we want to do that and, and worship together. It'll be a mashup, Spanish, English. I believe choir is even a part of something odd, you know. I give out all to Tim now, and so uh, to do that. So I just want to encourage you to come be a part of that, and uh, you'll see stuff if you pay attention with your emails and uh, through our social media stuff as well. And then you see the women's ministries having this, uh, man, praise and paint night. Praise and paint, amen. And so you guys can be a, learn see more about that. And then our next real meeting is going to be on August 6th. At 9 o'clock, and we want to encourage you to uh, be a part of that if you're a leadership in the church. And uh, we're going to talk about several things in there. And then uh, also if you're interested in learning more. And by the way, the ministry fair went really well last, uh, last Sunday. Thanks for all who helped with that and participated in all that. And uh, we're working on following up on all of those things uh, as well. Hopefully if you got to see, as you saw the tables, well, all the things that God is having us do for his glory and his kingdom around here. And we need a lot of help in all of those areas. And that's what we're supposed to do as a church. Amen? And so we had several people sign up and for, do for different things. And so we're encouraged by that as well. So that's the announcements for the week. Wake up. I know it's hot. It's hot. And so we had a blessed time here yesterday. Uh, we did a renewal service for Car Pastor Carlos and Carolina to their 25th anniversary. We did a renewal ceremony uh, here Believe it or not, there was cake and flower petals and tables all in here, and we had a, a blessed time together with that. So uh, glad to be part of that. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. As I've been doing, I'm going to read the whole chapter. We are going to focus on verse 5 today, but I want to read the whole chapter. Paul says, if I speak human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and if I give over my body in order to boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy, love is not boastful, love is not arrogant, love is not rude, it is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep a record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies... They will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put on childish, I put aside childish things. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, as I am fully known. Now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Father, thank you for this time in your word. As I pray every week, I pray I would decrease and you increase. 
Speak to our hearts and to our minds. Not just for information, but Lord, for transformation. Help us to love like Jesus, be like Jesus, become more like Jesus. For your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Before we start, or as we start, let me say it that way, let me be the first to say that as we get into this, because we're going to focus on verse 5, let me be the first to say, I'm sorry. If I know any of us, if we are all honest with ourselves, every single one of us can say I'm sorry when it comes to what I'm talking about this morning. So let's just go ahead and get 1 John 1, 9 out of the way. Amen? He says if we confess, with our, confess our sins, we confess with our mouth, that works too. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our trespasses and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Even you out there watching right now for what I'm going to talk about this morning, just go ahead and say it. Let's just get it over with and say, I'm sorry. We're going to focus on verse 5. It says, love is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable. And that's all I'm going to cover today. It's, it's so funny to me how God works. Because you never know when, when God gives you a, some things to put on your heart to preach, how he's going to speak and what, what he's going to speak to. And sometimes you say stuff and you preach stuff and you're like, eh, it's, it's, it's okay. But then it affects people differently. And, and, and preaching through 1 Corinthians 13, it's like, oh, hey, that's cool. Let's, let's do that. That's, that's, a, that's a great chapter. Everybody knows it. Everybody appreciates it. And then you start studying it. And then you start preaching it. And everybody starts getting really quiet. And everybody starts getting really introspective. And everybody starts getting real defensive. And a lot of people start coming up to you and start saying, gosh, man, it was like you were talking to me. To which my response to you guys, and one of that is every single time, is it wasn't me. And if you feel that way, you don't need to be talking to me about it. You need to talk to God about it. Because it's God who's speaking into your life and into your heart. And you have to be open to those kinds of things because that's the power of the Word of God. That's what 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 tells us. For correction, for rebuking, for training in righteousness. Now, with all that being said, which is totally not in my notes, but just felt like I needed to say it to start, who wants to be called rude, self-seeking, or irritable? Most people would say, not me. Yet, honestly, if we look at these characteristics... A lot of people in our culture are rude, self-seeking, and irritable. It's embraced, it's accepted, and even rewarded in some circles, including the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't believe me? Watch the news. If you're on social media, pay attention. If you've posted in social media, look back at your posts. Followers of Jesus should not be in those circles. We shouldn't even be associated with those circles. And I love how we 
cover this up. I'm just being prophetic. No, you're being rude. Most rude, self-seeking, and irritable people, and some of the most rude, self-seeking, and irritable people I know call themselves Christians and followers of Jesus. And don't worry, folks, like I said to start off, I don't, I'm probably not very far behind them sometimes. And that's wrong. We can see it in how we talk to one another. We can see it in how we relate to one another. We see it in our kids and grandkids, and we just we cringe at it, and we don't look at the mirror at ourselves. Where do they get it? Well, they just get it from watching Netflix and TV and social media. Don't put it all on them, boys and girls. They hear you. They hear me. Paul, in his explanation of love, continues his list of what love is not. Remember that these are verbs in the original language. They're not adjectives. Paul is seeking to change the behavior of a Corinthian church that was not loving as they should. I'm going to keep going. Because I'm sure it'll all come out in the wash eventually. The first thing he says is love is not rude. Now this word is not tied to being arrogant. This is a person who demonstrates poor manners does not care enough for those around him or her to be polite and sensitive to the people around them. And just that description the person is loveless, careless, overbearing, and often crude. Now, be careful to start picking out your grandkids here, folks. Look at what, remember what he says later? Now I only see a reflection. The mirror's on us, it's on you and me, it's on the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty one. For at the meal, each one eats his own supper. So one person is hungry and another gets drunk. We talked about this before. The Corinthians were a rude people. They were gifted, educated, talented in many ways. But they were snobbish, snooty, all those things with arrogance. They were rude the haves and the have-nots. The haves went first. This was in, the, in association with doing the Lord's Supper. And so there were some, this is, this is like having coin and eonites, having, having fellowship. It's like somebody in front in line getting ten pieces of fried chicken and when the person, the last person in line, all they get left is the dribble lessings of the bottom of the coleslaw. What's even worse about that is a person who gets the ten pieces of chicken and throws three of them away because they're full. Guess what that is? That's rude. They were in worship. And somebody would get a word and stand up. I can't let him have a word. i got to get my word in edgewise. Sound like a business meeting. Maybe that's what they were having, business meetings the whole time. 
So another person would stand up while another person is standing and be louder and more obnoxious or whatever they had to do to draw attention away from that person to him. That's rude. That's careless. There's other ways that we can do this. I just happened to find a list of a few as we go through these. Gossip's rude. Making fun at another person's expense is rude. That I, I have to confess and apologize to that. We, we brush it off by saying, I'm just kidding. Maybe we were, but it was still said. We often use jokes, and I joke a lot, and I use sarcasm a lot, and I have to be very careful, and I need to be more careful with that because not everybody takes sarcasm the same way. And yes, I get it, and we do live in an overly sensitized world, but that still doesn't take the responsibility not off of us to be slow to speak, in my case, slower to speak. And yes, when the younger generation disrespects the older generation, that is rude. And I'll say that to them in the next service, don't worry. On the other side of that, Paul says that we're not supposed to provoke our children to anger, and we do, when we do that, we're being rude. Rude Christians ascribe evil motives to others that are not true. I get this a lot. It's, it's kind of the nature of being in front of people, of being given a position that has some sense of whatever authority it is in front of it. And we live in a world today where most people... Don't even do it to your face. Not that they ever really did it to your face before the age of social media. But I've had things that I've said in here, they get posted out on some by somebody else, and people comment, and they say things about me that they would never say to my face. And I have to exercise a yielding to the Holy Spirit and practice self-control. I don't comment on most of it. But it, it gets you. Because nobody likes to be characterized by something that you're not. And most of us don't even think about whether or not we're rude or not because we're just so used to being rude to one another. And on social media, you can be rude and hide behind your alias that you post on Facebook or Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat. If you don't know what any of those things are, you're probably better for it. The world's rude, amen? Lost people, people who don't know Jesus, we call them lost in the Bible for those that are watching. Because you are. I was too. You can't expect them to not be rude. And it's amazing to me how we've allowed this to perpetuate. It's almost, at this point, seemingly like trying to keep the ocean back with a broom. And we 
Justify it. I don't want to get too caught up in this. I'm sure I'll have more along the way. Getting into somebody else's business that not yours, that's not yours is rude. Taking credit for another person's work is rude. Inappropriate questions are rude. Derogatory words, profanity, that's rude. If you go by the definition of the word in the New Testament, poor hygiene is rude when you're around other people. If you can do something about it. Eavesdropping is rude. Pointing at somebody and shouting is still rude. I catch myself and I always end up doing this. Hey, you, you, you. It's like the same. It's like my own justification. I'm, I'm just like, I'll just point at myself. Failing to control your temper. We'll get to that in a moment. Is rude. And I could keep going. Jesus wasn't rude. In Luke 7, beginning in verse 44, turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That's why she loved much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. Now, who's rude there? Simon? Simon was rude to Jesus. Jesus could have been rude and said, like the, like the disciples wanted to say, well, look at what she did. She just dumped a whole year's worth of stuff on your feet. But he was gracious and considered it. Knew her heart. Knew her motive. Knew her. And graciously accepted. And being gracious and considered is the very least that we can do. If followers of Jesus are rude... It can turn people away from Jesus before they even get a chance to turn to Jesus. See, we often don't think about that. This is where the gospel and our mission as followers of Jesus has to take priority in the forefront of our brain. All of these things when it comes to love. Has to be that. If somebody's rude to you, is our response to be rude back? That's our natural response. It should not be the Jesus response. Well, I'm entitled. No, you're not. Neither am I. Jesus was never rude. Love is not self-seeking. The idea of this word here is selfishness, seeking one's own way. It's kind of at one of those core heart things, right? I mean, isn't really a lot of life about this? It's about, you know, the opposite of this is being unselfish. But with the fall of man, and since we have that depraved nature we wrestle with as followers of Jesus, we are constantly seeking after our own. 
And it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that we can practice what we are supposed to do and what Paul says in Philippians 2, 4. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interests of others. Agape love, which we call, I just call God's kind of love, stands in complete opposition to the self-love the Corinthian church demonstrated and the self-love of the world in which we live. I got to worry about me. I got to take care of me. It's about me. Jesus was not self-seeking. Philippians 2, 5 through 11, Paul shares this. You guys know this passage. It's very familiar to us. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant, taking on the likeness of humanity. And when he had come as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What do we do, right? There's some things to help us diagnose if we're self-seeking. Maybe some things you haven't really thought about. Or give you a little twist on the thinking of it. If you have a never enough mindset, maybe a self-seeker. It's never enough. Never enough. What I'm doing, what I have, what I own, it's never enough. We say things like, if I lose weight, it will be enough. But it's not. If I buy a new car, that'll be enough. I'll be happy. If I get that promotion at work, that'll be enough. Is it ever enough? That drive that we have in us. Your mood shifts quickly from positive to negative based on the opinions of others. You know, we used to say, and that's this expression so old, it's it's just wrong, though. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. How many of us know that's a bold-faced lie from the pit of hell? They hurt. Quite frankly, some of the stuff that I've been called, I'd rather get hit with a block than get called some of this stuff. By people who know better, or should. Because they're seeking theirs. We all are seeking those types of things. That might be something. You think God needs to hold it together regardless of the mess in your life. He needs to hold you together. We enter over at our prayers when we come under these types of things. We pray a lot about ourselves. God, I just need you to do this. 
God, I need you to do this in that person's life so that I can have peace of mind. (laughs) Got to be careful about the vertical H, which is an I. Just some examples. Here's another one. If you have few meaningful relationships, there was a study several years ago, this goes with social media, but just makes a point, that the average American had 338 Facebook friends. In spite of that, the average American only has what they would describe as two close friends. And 25% of Americans say they have zero close friends. The loneliness, in spite of our connectivity in the world today, is epidemic. When you're thinking about yourself, you aren't willing to pay the price to have meaningful relationships. See, there's a a vulnerability that comes in getting to know somebody. There's a risk to opening up and having friends. There's a give and take in any relationship. And most people are so focused on themselves that they're not willing to take the chance. And so they are alone in their journey in life. There's a price to pay for intimacy with friends, folks. I mean, sometimes they go away. It means sometimes they go away and you didn't do anything to cause it. And because we avoid pain and we avoid hurt, we think it's easier to be alone. And if you think that way, that's about yourself. Just some things to think about. Last one I'll give you for that one is if you're cynical. And all cynicism really starts in here. Because you're actually more cynical about yourself than anything else. And it starts in here, and then you start, it just starts going out from there. We like to say we are our own worst what? Critic. And in some ways that's healthy, but in other ways it's not. If we beat ourselves up because we feel like we're being Christian, if we beat ourselves up, then we got a problem. And your cynicism about yourself will emanate and permeate out into your expressions and in your relationships and how you look at the world. And everybody will look at you and say, man, their person is so cynical. And guess who wants to hang out with a cynical person? Nobody. And then we come back, and our defense for that is to say, you know what? I've had a hard time. People have beat me up. Amen. I agree. Been there, done that, bought the T-shirt. I think I'm on my 50th T-shirt of that. And there was a season there for a while when I was, I was just, I just felt it. I was really, really cynical and It's like, God, i got to get rid of this because it affects your ministry. Why are you cynical? Because it's about me. 
always got to start here before you start blaming everybody else out there. You can't do anything about that there. But you can do something about this. The reality is that the root of our human nature is to seek its own. When we do that, we replace God with ourselves. This is not the way God desires for us to live. It robs us of hope because disappointment comes to us much easier when our expectations are not met And yet it's we are how we're supposed to love one another, but not being self-seeking. We need help. Expectations destroy us, folks. It's hard not to have expectations. It'd be easy to go through life and not, I'll be honest with you, I try not to have too many expectations of people. I certainly don't try and have any expectations of Christians or of non-Christians, non-followers of Jesus when it comes to this stuff. Because we're works in progress. And people will disappoint you. And people have disappointed you. Romans 5.5 5 says, this hope will not disappoint us. What hope? The hope of God, hope of Jesus. Because God's love has been poured out in our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. If we're going to be like Jesus and follow what he said, I did not come to be served but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many then, folks, we need the power of the Holy Spirit to be the dominant power and influence in our lives. Otherwise, it is inevitable that we will be rude and we will be self-seeking. And we will be irritable. Love is not irritable. It's not, it's, 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 that's... That's God's word, not mine. The word here has the idea of being provoked to anger. <laughs> Easily prone to outburst of emotion or action because of your anger. Are you one who gets angry and throws the plate across the room, punches the drywall, figure that's the healthy escape? The idea here is that love guards against being irritated or angered or upset by things that are said against us. That's from John MacArthur. That's a really good explanation. <laughs> There's some short fuses in the body of Christ, folks. Really short fuses. It's not loving. And we do this in all kinds of ways. We may not punch the drywall. Throw the golf club in the lake. I've never done that. <laughs> golf clubs are expensive, bro. Never threw the fishing pole in the pond there, Ed Adams. I do like watching the videos on Facebook. They're really funny when guys get upset at their golf swings. And, man, they just... I just decided a long time ago, I, I really, you guys know, I really enjoy playing golf, and I just decided a long time ago, if, if golf gets that serious for me that I'm willing to throw away a 
$120 golf club because of a one bad shot, I need to put the, put the clubs away and sell them. Now, I've come close an awful lot. People think that they're justified to have a short fuse. It's amazing to me how we think this is true. That comes back to self, doesn't it? I'm entitled. It's my right. Don't even get me started. I probably will get started. I'm trying to hold off. It affects our witness. We are usually easily provoked when we are self-seeking and not getting our way. It's okay to be angry at the things that God gets angry at in our world. That's verse 6, and we start, we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks. We don't find any joy in unrighteousness, but rejoice in the truth. We'll unpack that. And what that means. But I don't hear a whole lot of people getting angry about those kinds of things that matter to God. In fact, most of the things I hear followers of Jesus getting angry about have nothing to do with the plan and power of God and His purpose. The Corinthian church had in it those who were rudely self-serving and parading their gifts in front of those who were less gifted and less, had less status and made these less, less gifted people irritable. So do you get it? We had those that were going and grabbing 10 pieces of chicken. We had that, and they were happy and doing being rude and crude and all that other stuff. The person at the back of the line getting the drippings from the coleslaw pan, they get really irritated because they were treated like dirt, and that person threw three pieces of chicken away because they were full and practicing gluttony. Is it any wonder the body in Corinth had a problem? Sounds like church, doesn't it? It should never be that way. Just to use that example, do you know why when we do corn and nights, I always try and have it go by age. And I try and have fun with it. I do it for two reasons. One, to honor the elderly. The age challenged. I don't even know what the appropriate word is in 2022. And number two, and it's, it's, just, it's just part of growing up. When you're a child, you think like a child, you speak like a child. If I let teenagers get in front of you, you may be getting the bottom of the coleslaw. They don't think any different about it. They're just told to grab and get what they want. And they'll ask you. They'll ask, hey, Bill, Bill, say grab, get, grab as much as you want. Then Bill gets up there, and I've seen Bill eat. He ain't going to be happy about no bottom of the coleslaw pan. He's going to get up here on the choir and he's going to have a gringy, dousy face on him. Amen. And that is going to make you irritable. Now, we... We can, we, can, we can joke about this stuff, and we, we, we do. And let me just let me give you, you know, we like these, uh, these coffee little lines. You see them, on, you see them all the time on the, uh, on the Internet. They say things like this. We've all seen and laughed at the coffee jokes on social media. Don't talk to me until I've had my coffee. My favorite co-worker is the coffee pot. How to approach me before I've had coffee? Don't. And there's all kinds of them out there. And let's face it, for a lot of people, to help with their irritability, having a cup of coffee before you talk to them is probably not a bad idea. But these are lightheaded attempts to deal with something that's really a problem.
I mean, if we're keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus, what do we got to be irritable about? I mean, I hate bringing up Jesus into the conversation here, but I'm kind of going to. Jesus and being provoked to anger. Let me give you what Jesus got angry about. This will help us to figure out what we can get angry about and irritable about. He didn't like the human condition. That's why he came. John 11, when he arrives at Lazarus' tomb, And he sees the people are upset. What's it say he did? He wept. Why did he weep? He saw the toll of death on his creation. And that upset him. We ought to be upset about the condition of our world spiritually, because that's what ultimately matters. Do we cry? Do we get upset? That in California alone, there's probably 34, maybe oh, close to 35 million people who would die and go to hell today? Or do we put most on Facebook that we're really upset with Governor Newsom because he keeps taking my tax dollars and paying for illegal aliens to get health care? Which should grieve us more, O follower of Jesus? I'm not saying I agree with what Newsom's doing, but what should grieve us more? He didn't like religious rules being imposed on people at the expense of people. When he went into the temple and he turned the tables, because they were money changing, charging people for the offerings and everything before they could go in and do what they were commanded to do by God. You've turned my, my place into a den of thieves, and it should be what? A house of He got angry at kids being pushed aside. Don't tell kids to come. We ought to be a place that embraces kids. You know, in my last church, what I had to go through to get people to actually go past saying we want kids to come to our church and actually do something about having kids come to the church? How many times I had to get on them for getting on kids for being kids? See, we can't say we want kids in our church and not do anything and put, our, put time into saying we want kids to be in our church. Right? He doesn't like self-righteous judgmentalism either. Remember when he got on the Pharisees in Matthew 25? It says, you guys worry about what's going on on the outside of that cup, on the inside, you're filthy. You impose these things on the people and you don't even follow them yourself. That makes God angry. That makes him irritable. Making it hard for people to get to God. The gospel is free. Access to it should be free. And freely given. And freely offered. And selfish ambition. 
You go beyond those things, you didn't really see Jesus get too angry at stuff. I dare say you didn't get angry much at all. Not even with the disciples. Put it another way, Jesus did not get provoked to anger by things that often provoke us to anger. And the reason is because love would not allow it. And it goes to what I... You can't get away from these two verses when you talk about 1 Corinthians 13. They keep coming up over and over and over again. John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus says, I give you a new command, love one another, just as I have loved you. You are also to love one another. By this, everyone, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Remember, love one another is not the new command. It's love one another as I have loved you. By this, Everyone will know that you are my disciples. Not our theology. Not our political views. By our love for one another. I was talking about this with the college students on Friday night, really unpacking this this verse. It just keeps coming back to me in all kinds of contexts. And you know, you know why it is. It's it's you know you know you read. You guys have heard me talk about this, but you know, bless God. Come, we're about to come September. We are about to go on our 16 month. And let me take that back. 28 month election cycle. I'm so not looking forward to it. We got enough to deal with. We're having these things bombarded at us as the body of Christ that just keep taxing and challenging this command. And bless God, we've just been, we're kind of getting out of our two and a half years of COVID and figuring out how to deal with it. And now we're dealing with all the frustrations and the fallout of that about what is and isn't working, what, how it does this and does that. And now I got to deal with midterms. And elections. And as a citizen of this country, it is our right, and we should absolutely participate in all of that. I encourage you to do so. I'm almost afraid to say this. I might not even say it. I'm not going to say it. I'm sure it's going to come out by the time this is all said and done. Let us remember, no matter how you feel about somebody when it comes to that stuff, because that stuff ends up permeating to everything else. It affects 
fellowship. It affects discipleship. It affects evangelism. It affects ministry. It affects our worship as the body of Christ. Please don't sit there and tell me it doesn't. I've seen it over and over and over again. And realize that a lot of you in this room are going to be on the right side of Calvary. And there's a lot of other people coming in the rest of this morning who are going to be on the left side of Calvary. And guess who you're supposed to love? Them too. And guess who they are supposed to love? You too. It's why we need to get together, church family, when we can get together. See, the problem in Washington, I grew up there, y'all, lest you forget. It used to be that when you were elected to Congress or the Senate, you ended up staying there a lot. You came home every now and then, you, but you stayed there on the weekends. And guess what you did? You went to church together on the left side and the right side of the cross. You played in softball leagues and all kinds of stuff. You dealt with a lot of the issues over the dinner table on Capitol Hill. And things got past, whether you liked them or didn't like them or it wasn't exactly what you wanted or exactly what somebody wanted. And usually bills don't end up being everything somebody wants or somebody else wants because we haven't had full and all that stuff and able to block all that stuff. And you know that. But they actually liked each other when they weren't on the floor of the House of Representatives defending their points of view and the bills that they were trying to get passed. Guess what they do now? They don't stay in Washington on the weekend. They go home to their constituencies and get their ears tickled and then go back to D.C. and do it all over again. And what gets done? Nada. We can't do that in church. It's not loving. It's rude. It makes us self-seeking. And it makes us irritable. So let's not do that. Let's not do that. Let's make it about the gospel. Make it about loving one another. So that they know we are followers of Jesus. Father God, thank you for this time in your word. Thank you for showing us what love is. Father, it's only by your spirit in us can we do this. And that requires us to surrender our whatever we got to surrender so that you can be in control. Control of our hearts, our minds, our fingers, our thumbs, and our tongues. Lord, the gospel's at stake. And Father, I won't speak for anybody else. They can talk to you just as much as I can. As for me, I confess my rudeness, my self-centeredness, and my irritability. May you work in my life and in my heart for your glory and your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. Hey, thanks for being here this morning. Go have fun in Sunday school, and we'll see you back here next week. See you next week.